failures of the past than you do looking at the successes. You need to understand why things have failed. Great to showcase successful solutions, etc. But you learn more lessons, especially hopefully it's somebody else's lesson. Um, but if you can learn from their mistakes and you know grow and evolve, then uh, we've got a lot more chance of thriving in the future. This particular presentation I hold don't downgrade your GPT to fit your reality, because reality is what we deal with every day. And it's far from perfect. We, there's a dozen, there's a dozen, there's a plethora, there's a million reasons why your GPTs and other stormwater treatment infrastructure is probably not meeting its expectations. We do a lot of auditing, and we've got a very good handle on why these things are working or not working, etc. But that's great that you know why things aren't working. <coughs> What we want is, is vision. We want inspiration. We want to dream big. We want to get solutions out there that are actually going to meet our expectations. Our expectations are all about um, high quality environments, happy public, safe waterways and beaches, etc. And if we dream small, we can probably get there. If we dream big, you know, that's what the community wants. We want targets set up here. It might take us three centuries to get there, but we want we want our GPTs and our stormwater treatment infrastructure to match our dreams. But it's step by step. It's not a matter of you know. There's no silver bullet. There's no one answer fixes everything. There's a treatment train. There's policies and strategies. Everything from concepts to decommissioning of existing structures. It all it's all part of one big ever evolving industry. And what we've got at the moment is an industry that, you know, um, there's two new players, not new, they've been around for a while, but, you know, Ocean Protect and, uh, and Spell have come up with their own continuous deflective separation technology devices. And, you know, it's an evolution of the industry. So previously, if you would have had to buy something from Rockler, now you've got more choice about sort of the, you know, number one performing device in the industry. So it's, you know, happy days for you guys. That's, uh, that's a big leap forward in the industry. But it's also about, you can't just dream big without also going, well, here's some of the stuff we've done in the past, it didn't quite work, what can we do about that? That's what this paper says. Let's go back to my paper. How do I, You might have to click on the mouse on the file. So, uh, yeah. Perfect. <coughs> All right. Now the reality is, this was actually a good device in a good location, constructed okay, but over the course of time suffered multiple uh, issues and problems. Um, and the particular council has it put up this fence around the lid, the four-part Gaddock lid, that had surcharged and blown. The question wasn't asked until we got in there and ordered it and checked it, etc. Why is it blowing? When it was realised that the weir was actually built 300 mils too high. It didn't have enough bypass capacity, so the weir had to be cut down. Because the system was pressurising, the whole manhole access was blown off, and the Gaddock lid in here, the central beam was all displaced and you know, the surrounds were broken. And on a couple of occasions, these Gaddock lids blew off and fell inside. But every time it surcharged, all the pollution ended up going straight over the, uh, the council car park nearby. Here it is today. We've put on an appropriate lid that can't fall inside. A surcharge break over the top of the axis allows it to surcharge. But we've dropped the weir height down. Now it's not going to surcharge because there's insufficient bypass capacity. That's also allowed access to behind the weir to clean that and do that correctly. The total drain's got even got it, you know, fully operational again. So now it's working at 100%, doing everything it should. And I think the cost on that was approximately 8% of the capital cost of a new device. But it took it from non-operational 
you're 100% operational, meeting council's dreams for 8%. So it doesn't have to cost the earth. This was a trash rack, and I don't quite understand the, the evolution and the logic that whoever had designed this. Basically, this, this area here that looks like something solid is actually a rack. That's after a storm event. This is plastered with organics. But so it doesn't pool water, they cut a big hole underneath here to allow everything out. So what's it actually catching? And the answer was nothing. It's online, it's undersized, it wasn't performing. What we've looked at doing in this particular case is a graduated stepped offline trash rack, much, much bigger pollution storage area, beautified the whole area, decreased the hydraulic impact of the existing situation, and you know, now it's working, council's happy, the whole area is being beautified. Um, it's still a trash rack. But as far as trash rakes go, it's now one that works, it can be cleaned, it's meeting their expectations. Here's another trash rack. They seem to be making a bit of a comeback. Um, this particular one, we've got the same issue. There was a, uh, a weir at the bottom with a hole through it, that would readily block, fill up to the top. The online uh, rack itself would block and then, of course, it's online, so everything overtops and they lose everything. So the downstream creek was in a really poor condition. The downstream of that was a wetland that was absolutely full of litter, sediment, um, and, you know, all the organics that went in there, releasing their nutrients, algal blooms, the whole lot. The first stage of the, of the solution was obviously, again, to put in a graduated offline step trash rack. This has got... Underneath here, you can't quite see it in this photo. So the backhoe can actually get in there, pull the stuff to the side and lift it out. There's a, there's a concrete plinth along here. Um, it's, I think, about five times the area of the previous one. It works really well in storm events. Not only that, though, we also looked at putting in sedimentation system downstream. So there's an access pad over here. So the sediment that still goes through your trash racks um, can actually be caught by this weir and take it out. The creek was then cleaned, and then subsequent to that, they can get in and rehabilitate the wetland downstream. So it's gone from something that was online and ineffective to something that's, you know, it's ugly, but it's actually effective in meeting their expectations. This is an ecosol. Um, I don't know how much you know about the internals of an ecosol, but this is the bypass area where the flow is supposed to be going around one side, and this is around the other side. In this particular case, the device itself, <coughs> see there's the, there's the pipe area up the front. The Ecosol is too small. The Ecosol was installed exactly where they wanted it to, but with no thought about the downstream hydraulics. It couldn't physically work in that given situation because the downstream, it had to surcharge up and flow out. So as soon as the water fills up, went straight over the Ecosol sides, um, and this is all deposited in the bypass area because the whole thing just submerged. Too small, difficult to maintain, uh, which meant it didn't get maintained, and then it just sat there and then started surcharging upstream, etc. Whilst it, oh, this is Steve. Hey, Steve. He's got the job that no one wants. Um, climbing inside an ecosol with a, a plasma cutter, cutting the thing apart and pulling it all out. And they're putting in a baffle trap to allow something that's, it's not ideal, but it's, it's now going to trap the floatables, which was the main thing that was of concern here, uh, and it'll trap a lot of the core set levels. But the thing is, it's bloody easy to clean. So the council guys have previously thrown their hands up, um, said, yeah, yeah, this is what we want, more of these. Now that's not a fantastic trap, but it's a hell of a lot better and more maintainable than what they have. This is a product called the Clevertech. We don't have those here in New South Wales, thank God. Um, this is down in Victoria. You can imagine a, a pin cushion over in, um, uh, you know, India, lying down on a pin cushion and, and you know, hoping you don't get blown all over yourself. Um, invert that around the other way. <coughs> flow, 
So this is the top, this is the shot looking into it as the flow goes down and then has to go up through the racks and then flow out down the pipe. And to hold the pollution away from these racks that were very flimsy and, and bent and broken and everything else, they put in all these steel impaling spikes to uh, you know, hold the pollution away from the rack that was in here. If a dog gets washed down the line, you're going to find a dead dog impaled on these things. God forbid a child should come down the line. From a work health and safety point of view, how the hell did this product ever get built? Allowed to get built. Um, and to clean it, these, these arms sort of hold it in, in, lock it in position, and they bend, and you clip this up on the wall, and then you stand in here, and you, you manually pull the things off these impaling spikes. God forbid the bloody bracket should fail, you know, good night I read. Apart from it being a work health and safety absolute nightmare, very low performance, uh, things would get forced through the gaps, Resuspension, you know, not a high quality device. Council learned their lesson and said, what can we do with it? Optimal Storm would have said, here's a good idea. We can use the entire structure of that device, rip out all the internals, fill up the base of it. We put a weir across here to actually direct the flow offline <coughs> and put a, a continuous deflective separation device over on the side. So we, but by using the existing infrastructure, we were able to probably reduce the cost of the overall project by about 30%. And it doesn't look so embarrassing when you're using the existing infrastructure and just adding to it. And uh, as a result, you know, council's deliriously happy, things working a treat. Um, council doesn't have work health and safety problems, their environment's now protected. You know, now they've got something that's meeting their dreams and expectations. Um, but no devices. You know, going to be unscathed in this report, in this uh, presentation. This is a cleanse all that uh, at the time when it went in, this is the opening into the device and the cleanse all is over in here. <coughs> the top of the weir, they put it in and in the first storm event, it blew all the leads, leads turned, fell inside, smashed all the baskets, etc. Had to pull all the lids out, the baskets out, get new baskets, put them all in. And then they cut the weir down to here. And then about six months later, it blew all the lids, lids fell in, smashed all the baskets again. So then they cut it down to here. So this is a device that normally has a 1200 high weir to drive it with a weir that's this high. <laughs> and when you've only got a 300 high weir, flow would actually go in, spin around, jack up hydraulic jump inside the device, come back out here and flow around. So they were losing all their floatables. The baskets inside got twisted and bent, differential settlement with this thing. When we finally came to do something about it, flow was going into the device and there was no flow coming out. There were that many cracks and leaks and things in the, in the joints, the flow was just going into the ground. But unfortunately it was built on an old tip site on the side of the hill and lead shape was now coming out of the side of the hill, bringing all sorts of nasty to it. Didn't meet their expectations. And this hole that you're looking at here, so the flow actually goes in, down, through the baskets, across underneath, rises back up out of here, and then flows off down there. Normally that would be a pipe that continues straight, but because it's on the edge of a hill, they've got a big vertical 10 metre drop pit, and then it flows out at the bottom. What we ended up doing, one of the biggest problems was it kept blowing its lids, because of the, the steep grade of the catchment upstream. So the diversion chamber and everything was already in there, and the cleanse all was on the other side. But we looked to put a drop off take into the diversion chamber, so now it doesn't have a weir. So the whole hydraulics of the system is now upgraded to meet council's expectations, forms of the CDS unit is doing very well. So it comes into the chamber and drops into here, goes through the CDS, comes back out through here. We've cut a new outlet slot into the drop shaft downstream of it. So there it is during operation with the flow ripping through, no weir in sight, no hydraulic impact, happy days. And then, you know, the CDS is doing what it does. Um, in this particular case, it was a Hume guard. You know, there are great places to put Hume guards. This wasn't one of them. You don't put a Hume guard on the 14% grade pipe upstream. 
the velocity coming in destroys it. The Hume guard is a, is a you know, very well-known device, and it's designed that the velocity going through it should be 0.2 metres a second. If I walk at 0.2 metres a second, it tells you the flow rate or the velocity that you're expecting to go through the device. On a 14% grade pipe, it's ripping. What it's actually done is, is bent and twisted the weir. So when you look at that and you see pollution caught over the top of the weir, you know that this floating boom weir is not moving at all. Consequently, it's, it's diverting too much water for treatment, it's resuspending, and uh, it's, it's you know, not meeting its expectations. In this case, we end up putting another CDS off the side, but again, <coughs> using the structure itself to um, act as a diversion chamber. Happy days, all went well. This is a huge sector of Lara. It needs to be protecting a pump. It needs a screen in it to stop the plastic bags and other things that are going to destroy the pump. That's an oil and grit separator. It wasn't going to meet the expectations. Underneath here is a baffle arrangement to stop hydrocarbons getting in and then a submerged screen. Uh, that is very simple and easy to clean. There we go. Uh, this is a tricky site at uh, Kernel where they've got a SEP 14 wetland downstream. Very high priority for them to keep, uh, get that under control. But upstream of here is a very industrial catchment and lots of pollution getting in here, regular spills. They said, what can we do? But you can't build a weir. You can't have any hydraulic impact. What we ended up looking at doing was putting in submerged trash racks. Not ideal, but it's going to at least give them some sort of outcome. Because the flow is going to come out and drop through the first one, the first one will block. Then the flow will go through the second, the second one will block. Now you're going to have triple baffles um, to allow settlement and accumulation, and in high flows it's going to rip straight across it. Next thing though, you also need a boom. But to dewater all this, you've got to have a weir at the back, and you've got to have a dewatering sump off to the side. And the first spill event they had, the whole thing worked exactly as it was supposed to. Everything's sort of being funneled down here. You can suck it all out, dewater the whole system. So it actually works as well as it could at that particular site. Um, this is a battery trap. You know, in the right situation, it's a it's a good trash rack. Uh, see this line along here? That's the tide line at which it bypasses upstream. But because these were so small and they're just mesh, it blocks and went into bypass, you know, in minutes. Never meeting council's expectations. Um, and spent more time in bypass and actually treating the flow. So we, we got in, we analysed what needed to happen, and ta-da! Now we've also got a set of stairs to meet, you know, today's work health and safety expectations. You're not going to be driving a, a bobcat or a backhoe down here. It's too steep, you can't turn around and access it, etc. Now we've got more than 10 times the screening area to allow the thing to actually function like it's supposed to. Um, on concrete banks down, that's a previous shot of the one that was in there. And the, um, when it overtops, it overtops onto here, but then it's still online and then it overtops and loses, and you still end up with all the pollution downstream. Not quite meeting council's expectations, so it got upgraded. They had the choice of throwing a little bit of money at it or a lot. They threw a lot of money at it, and this thing has got to be 20 times the size of what was in there previously. And a um, uh, topic of another presentation next door coming up, um, but it's, it's doing really well. <coughs> All those finished. This is the CDS unit, and I'd, I'd identified that uh, there was a hole in the screens. And uh, when I turned up and then we finally got to pump it all down, there's a piece of screen there. The cleaning contractor with their grab had ripped the entire screens out. So we put them all back. <laughs> Exclusion bars over the inlet. You learn over time. That's not meeting anyone's expectations. That's the reality of what they had. That was blocking, bypassing, pollution ending up in the downstream environment. It's a matter of learning how these things function and how they need to be cleaned. And here, vertical exclusion bars, gaps at the bottom, no crossbar, nothing to catch on, and the thing works like a tree. So, don't let the bean counters and naysayers you know, as well get you down. There's plenty of those around, no shortage. You need to dream bigger. 
You need to look backwards and you know think about what you can do. We want things that are more effective, easier to maintain, cheaper to maintain, delivering the outcomes that we can all be proud of. So just because you've got underperforming devices, and everyone does, don't leave it at that. You can improve them. You can you can be better and you can be bigger. So with that, I'll leave you all the board. Dream big. Before all that happened, yeah. have you got any feel for why, in the first instance, is there anything that comes up that's more often than not the cause for installation? Is it, is it the capital works project? Is it the development of the new ones? Is there other skills going on? Is there anything that is causing these problems? Look, there's a lot of reasons why problematic GPTs have been called. <coughs> Number one thing is ignorance on how these things actually perform. Number two is capital cost. Everyone wants something cheaper, so they end up going, you know, a lesser performing device, and that gets undersized, etc. And obviously, the maintenance of these devices. If you don't have the funding to clean them regularly, so you won't be surprised to learn if you put in high performing devices that have a big storage sum, it costs you more capital. But it's going to cost you less over the life cycle. Um, if you put in little cheap things and they're cleaning all the time, you know, the life cycle costs are going to blow it out of the water. And when that happens, the maintenance doesn't happen. So you've only spent half the money up front, but then you've got no outcome out of that. We've also I've discovered you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of situations where contractors um, have swapped out the device that's been designed and something else has been put in. And very commonly, the something else that's been put in doesn't hydraulically function the same. It's got more impact or less impact. It can't handle backwater. It can't handle velocity or whatever. So there's a lot of devices. So as the industry has, has evolved and grown and learned, we now know, you know, if you've got steep graded pipes, use vortex type style systems that use the energy. Don't try and fight against it. Use it to your benefit. If you've got flat slow pipes, you know, things like a new guard, you know, they're still in the mix. Um, so we're learning better when and where you should use these things. And when and, you know, if we can swap them or not. And hopefully through Squareb and you know, development of the industry, we're going to have more information, better information, you know, an evolution in, in the products that are available, more choice in, you know, better opportunities to meet our, uh, you know, collective expectations. <coughs> so I'm enthused. I'm excited about what this industry, not so much where we've come from, but the opportunities that we're, we've got moving forward. Um, it's still early days where we're learning on a lot of fronts. Um, if we can get more funding in it through the Stockman Management Service Charge, with the maintenance guidelines, if we can get these things cleaned better, if we can you know, increase the frequency of cleaning, we're going to get a hell of a lot better outcome. And if we can look backwards and fix some of our, you know, the reality devices of the past, you know, the reality is, I spent some of my time climbing inside these devices with spiders and cockroaches and silk and slime and scum, etc. But I'm doing that to, you know, pull back clients and meet their dreams. So that's where we're at. Yes, Jim. Uh, thanks, Murray. Um, I would like to, I'm, I'm a member of uh, ASTM, American Society of Testing and Materials, yep. and we're cur currently setting up uh, test standards for hydrodynamic separators, and one of those will be uh, setting up a protocol for laboratory testing of uh, devices for the removal of trash and debris, yep. and I would love for you to be on that committee um, based on, on that level of experience. <laughs> Not much to join, and uh, so, invitation's open. We'll talk after this, but I'll test you after that. Cheers, Mike. So we've hit the 405, unless anyone's desperate, they can always hit you up later anyway. I'm here all week. Yeah. So, right. um, I think we'll... Yeah, got a question. Oh. Yeah. What, like, what's the, how do you feel, because you've been doing this for quite a while now, you've got so much experience, how do you feel councils are tracking with this generally? Is I it getting better? I feel the level of, of knowledge and understanding of councils, they're now starting to realise the, the scope of their, their problem. The first thing is once you've done the auditing and you actually understand what you've got in the ground and is it working or not, you can then make decisions based on you know fact and, and 
accurate information rather than, oh, well, you know, this is what we did on the last project, so we'll do the same thing again. Um, so I think councils are generally, they're learning more. Um, I'm seeing more people, oh, how do I put this? Understanding the issues better, understanding the lack of funding and how to do that, understanding the maintenance requirement of these. I mean, it's taken years to drum it into to some of the councils that these things need more maintenance. But there's also options for, you know, um, improving the cleaning frequency. Some need more cleaning, some need less, you know, shuffle the money around, get better outcomes. I'm seeing a lot more um, passion and understanding and acknowledgement and, and things. So I think councils are learning. It's, it's, we've got a long way to go, but, uh, you know, I think we're on a good path. And, um, you know, I'm sorry for what the future will bring. All right, we're going to wrap up there, guys. Thanks, Rob.